Hi everyone. I'm Suzanne Clements, one of the pastors at Trinity United Methodist Church in Lafayette, Indiana. And it's a joy for me to be sharing the message uh, today on Pentecost Sunday. So how many of you who are listening or watching today enjoy a good party? Well, my guess would be that most all of you probably would say yes. There may be a few introverts um, wondering, well, it depends. <laughs> um, but most of us enjoy a good party. And uh, as a young person, I thought I knew all about good parties. Um, after all, I had um, been to college and experienced some party culture. Um, but then I spent a summer in the south of France when I was 23 years old. And I think once before I've shared about my time in France, uh, about a year and a half ago when I gave a message about hospitality, uh, because I also learned a lot about hospitality during my time in France. Well, the summer that I spent in France was in the southwest region of the country where uh, there's a tradition there where every village has about a week-long summer festival. Um, and these festivals are called fetes or, or parties generally. Um, and these parties uh, include the running of the bulls in the streets of the villages. Uh, there's a party in the town square every night with live music and dancing and cookouts and drinks. And uh, everyone in the villages, uh, whether it's a small or larger village or city, comes out for the fets. And then on the last night of the week, they butcher and barbecue um, a bull and have a huge feast. Um, and it's the biggest party yet. And all of the villages schedule their fets during different weeks, um, anywhere from middle to the end of the summer. So you can really spend um, most of the summer in the south of France partying. And when I was there, I got to experience a lot of this culture and it felt incredibly, incredibly fun and extravagant to me. I never experienced anything like this. Well, our scriptures um, also indicate that our spiritual ancestors, going all the way back to the Israelites and also the early church, well, they also really knew how to celebrate and have an extravagantly good time together. Um, there were many festivals in the Jewish calendar, and several times a year, uh, the people would travel great distances for anywhere uh, from a day to up to a week a full week to worship and to celebrate together. Um, this was also a cultural celebration for them um, as their identity as God's chosen people shaped all that they did. And in our scripture reading today, which is from the book of Acts, uh, the people have gathered in Jerusalem for the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, um, as it was known. And this was an observance that occurred 50 days after Passover. And it marked the beginning of the harvest of wheat. Now, for us as, as Christians today, we observe Pentecost 50 days after Easter. And uh, the people on this day gathered to give thanks to God, to make sacrifices, um, and to share the joy of life together um, through, uh, through feast and observance. And so they intentionally, ritually set aside time to remember God's goodness, to celebrate, to rest from labor. And on the Pentecost, after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, uh, God's people had come from far away, from other nations, uh, to Jerusalem to give thanks to God. Um, and on this, in this particular year, Jesus' followers, um, about 120 of them, they were also there in Jeruz Jerusalem. And they were following Jesus' instructions to them to go to Jerusalem and to wait together for the Holy Spirit to come to them. And they really didn't know what they were doing exactly. You know, they didn't know what they were waiting for. But they were being obedient and they were waiting uh, expectantly together. And then suddenly the Spirit comes and fills them and gives them extraordinary ability. And it's, it's a mysterious, um, uh, almost, um, it's a spirit-filled scene. And uh, so there's this wind-like roar 
that they hear, and then everyone there is filled with inspiration and the ability to speak in a language not their own. And this is a very public, visible movement of the Spirit. And all of the people who have come to Jerusalem for the festival hear what's going on. Um, they hear and they see this group speaking in um, their own native languages. And they can see that something has happened to them, something powerful has come upon them. And at first they're confused uh, because they can also still hear um, in their voice, their dialect. They can tell that they're from Galilee. And you have to understand too that Galileans, people from Galilee, didn't have um, a great reputation necessarily. Um, this was kind of the backwater region. And um, so it's important to see that the Spirit descended on these followers of Jesus, on these Galileans first. And so what happens then is that the fo these followers are empowered to speak in a way that all the others around them can understand. And so the space between them is filled in. The apostles become, the followers become this new creation, full of a spirit so good and joyous that it stops about 3,000 of these other people who were gathered here um, in their tracks. And the Spirit then brings them all together in heart and mind so that these 3,000 that are there are baptized and become the church. And all of them are unified by the Spirit moving amid all these diverse peoples. And the church is born on this day. Well, what, the thing I think that most stood out to me um, about Pentecost before, and perhaps it's the same for you, was for me the miracle of people speaking in new languages. And uh, there's also this image of, of flames on their heads. And um, I, I used to imagine this almost a cacophony of languages being spoken simultaneously as a sign of God's power. Um, but as I've studied uh, Pentecost more closely, I don't understand it that way anymore. Um, because the apostles were empowered to be able to speak in the native tongues of all of those who were gathered there to celebrate Pentecost. So far from being this cacophony um, or this uh, kind of chaotic um, voicing of languages, the words that they were speaking were understood and rang deeply true to all of those who heard them. Right? So the followers who had who had waited for the companion, for the Holy Spirit to come, they were blessed with this ability to be an authentic witness of God's grace and mercy. And as the companion emboldened and equipped them so extravagantly that it had this immediate impact on everyone who came into contact with them. And uh, these followers from different communities and nations became unified together as the Spirit moved among all of them. And as I've been mulling over uh, this particular sermon, I've been reflecting about what it means to speak someone else's language. On the one hand, it's true, isn't it? That to be able to reach someone else, to truly connect with them, we, we, we feel that we have to be able to speak their language, right? There's some truth to that. Um, and this has been especially on my mind recently because we have a new family um, here at Trinity that doesn't speak English. You know, so I've been wondering, how do we build relationship with them? You know, how do we communicate with them? Um, now, the family does speak some Spanish. So if any of our Trinity folks speak Spanish, I would love for you to reach out and let me know because uh, you can play um, an important role in helping us welcome this family. But on the other hand, we've also been given through the Spirit uh, the language of compassion and of kindness, of peace, of patience, of generosity. And when the fruits of the Spirit are what fill us and connect us, um, I'm not sure that our linguistic differences are the barriers that they might be otherwise. The Spirit is capable of filling us with a multitude of love languages, you know, languages that have the power to speak much louder than words. Um, you can think about the difference it makes to you, right? When someone stops what they're doing, walks up to you, smiles, and gives you their undivided attention, right? That takes no words at all. 
and yet it has a meaningful, tangible impact. Um, I can also think back to my time in France when I was traveling from village to village to enjoy the summer festivals. And while my French language skills did improve while I was there, especially at first, I was nowhere near a confident French speaker. And yet, I was welcomed and I felt right at home in the feasting and the dancing, <clears throat> the joy of the spirit of the parties. It was so authentic and it was so welcoming and so inclusive. And you know, when you're out dancing with others under the moonlight, it really doesn't matter what language is booming you know, through the speakers. Um, the spirit of the party brings everyone together. And there's another Bible study uh, story about a party uh, that has relevance for us um, today. Uh, Jesus once told a story about a father who had two sons. Um, one of them, his older son, loved his family um, and was committed to his family. And he was his father's right-hand man, always faithful, hardworking, ready to do anything for the family that was needed. The younger son, on the other hand, was eager to leave home as soon as he could. Uh, he asked for his inheritance early, and his father gave it to him and permitted him to leave. He didn't have to stay and earn it. He just took it and left. And this younger son spent several years off on his own, um, neglecting his family, living loosely, squandering his money, eventually living miserably, suffering, and deeply regretting his ways. Um, and even after many years of the son being gone, the father never forgot about the, the younger son. He kept his heart open to him, and he kept his eye out for him, and he was always ready to welcome him back home. And one day, the younger son did return home in rags and in shame. And uh, Jesus tells us that the father saw him coming from a long way off and immediately gave the word for everyone to prepare for the biggest party imaginable. Uh, no expense was to be spared. They were going to have the most extravagant feast and party ever. The father didn't wait to hear the son's story or get an apology. Um, the father took off running to his son and embraced him and kissed him and welcomed him home with joy and open arms. No questions asked. And this is the God that we celebrate on Pentecost Sunday. A God who is so merciful and extravagant that we can hardly wrap our minds around it. I mean, can you picture the young son on the day of his welcome home, right? The day of his extravagant party. Uh, his father outfitted him with the best clothes, put the most beautiful ring on his finger, the best shoes on his feet. Um, the son, I imagine, must have just shimmered in awe and in joy at the mercy and the unconditional love that awaited him that day. And I wonder if words, if language failed him in that moment. You know, perhaps he was so stunned and overwhelmed by a joy too deep for words. Or um, perhaps his gratitude overflowed such that he gushed words of thanksgiving to his father. Um, I imagine that everyone looking at him could see the flame of the Spirit dancing within and around him, whether he was able to speak any words or not. Pentecost reminds us that the Spirit moves as it will, that it cannot be contained or predicted, um, and it descends on those who are deserving and undeserving in whatever a way we imagine those categories. And in fact, what our stories of faith teach us is that the Spirit is probably more likely to move in ways that may surprise those of us who see ourselves as God's most faithful, right? The ones who are really following God's ways. Um, those of us who are confident and proud in our own effort and in our own understanding. But the truth is, 
that we cannot do anything to earn God's love and companionship. It's not a matter of getting our life in order so that God will accept us or straightening ourselves up or engaging in just the right spiritual program or practice so that we can inch closer to God's approval. God's spirit blows where it will. It's all grace. All we have to do is wait and be open, turning humbly to God with our empty hands outstretched in love, just like that younger son. And it can be hard to believe that it's so simple, but it is. And that is the good news, not just for us, but for everyone. This is really the good news that we have to share. And such a promise of unconditional love should give us deep hope and deep joy. And others around us should be able to see this hope and joy in us. We should be known as people always ready for a party because as God's beloved children and God's church, we have so much to celebrate. So happy birthday, church. I hope each of you feel the love today and every day.